In Honduras, President Alexia Mara Castro's Partido Libre expelled 18 deputies who betrayed the coalition agreement for the election of the President of the National Congress. In Europe, health agencies confirmed the presence of the Omicron variant of the coronavirus in the 27 countries of the European bloc. The United Nations Secretary General Antonio Guterres has condemned the attacks launched by the coalition led by Saudi Arabia against a detention center in the Yemeni city of Sada, which so far has left 60 dead and more than 100 injured. Hi, this is from the South. I am your news anchor, Diego Martin, from the Telesur Studios in Havana. We begin with the news. In Honduras, President Xiomara Castro's Partido Libre expels 18 deputies who betrayed the coalition agreement for the election of the President of the National Congress. The president-elect of Honduras, Yamara Castro, read the resolution that was taken unanimously in an extraordinary meeting of the political organization, indicating that the dissident deputies defied the authority of the party while explaining the seriousness of the facts since they put at risk the constitutional order of the country and the agreements reached for the reestablishment of democracy. After the announcement, Castro asked the militancy to go to the basement of the Congress to avoid the hijacking of the institution. El Salvador celebrated this Saturday the beatification ceremony of two priests and two parishioners executed by the military and death squads. The ceremony will be held at the El Salvador del Mundo Square located in the capital of the city of San Salvador. The event is scheduled to begin at 5 p.m. local time. About 200 delegations from different parts of the world are expected to participate and about 40 special guests, among them relatives of Rutilio Grande and the young Nelson Rutilio Lemus, who will also be beatified. Cardinal Gregorio Rosa Chavez will preside the ceremony as representative of Pope Francis and will be accompanied by 25 bishops and 600 priests. Rutilio Grande was born on July 5, 1928 in the town of El Paisnal. He entered the seminary in 1941 and joined the Company of Jesus in 1945. He received his formation in Europe and Latin America. Rutilio was also part of the seminary of San Jose de la Montaña and the rural zone. He faced the social and political reality of El Salvador with the murder of peasants, unionists, and social fighters by landowners in alliance with the military governments of Julio de Alberto Rivera, Fidel Sanchez Hernández, and Arturo Armando Molina were predominant. During this period, several priests were also victims of assassinations, kidnappings, and persecutions. Now, with our interest in the migrant caravan that is currently in southern Mexico after the Mexican authorities prevented its march towards the north of the country. More than 800 migrants were trying to continue their journey to the United States border, but were detained after protesting against the Mexican National Migration Institute, denouncing that their regularization procedures have been systematically delayed. Citizens who make up the caravan demand to be allowed to transit through the country based on their right for a better life, far from violence and insecurity. Luis Garcia Villagran of the Center for Human Dignity blamed the immigration authorities for the lack of resolution, the slowness of the procedures, and the violence exercised in trying to contain the march. Social and political movements in Bolivia celebrated on Saturday the 13th anniversary of the naming of the country as a plurinational state. The ceremonies began with an offering to the Pachamama, or Mother Earth, with the participation of the President Ruiz Arce Catacora Vice and Vice President David Chocahuanca, among other high government officials. Representatives of the different social sectors, members of the Pact of Unity, and the Bolivian Workers' Center were also present. As part of the celebrations, the head of state addressed the nation at the presidential palace in La Paz, where he emphasized that plurinationality gave a new meaning to the Bolivian state as an alternative to capitalism, establishing a relationship of harmony with nature. And we must also stress that the construction of our purely national state goes beyond the recognition of na nations, of cultures, of ancestral roots, of languages, of dances, of fabrics, since plurinationality gives a new meaning to the state, a civilizing political horizon alternative to capitalism. Living well, the collective construction of a culture of life where the political, social, and economic organization is oriented towards the production and reproduction of life in harmony with our Mother Earth. During his speech at the commemorative celebrations, the President Luis Arce recalled that the plurinational state is inspired by the cultural identity of the native peoples and the popular sectors of the country. 
Thus, Bolivia begins to walk the path of a new type of state and society that surpasses the modern and republican state, which is inspired by the identity and culture of indigenous people and farmers, choosing the historic project of the popular sectors. This is what makes it possible to promote a political project that gives dignity and identity to all citizens who are now part of the construction of a model of coexistence and a way of understanding democracy, such as intercultural democracy. The systemic violence that affects Colombia does not stop. This Friday, Bocaya's representative of the Assembly, Armando Quinones, suffered an attack while he was on his way to his farm in Pauna, in the central east of that country. The congressman reported that two men on a motorcycle fired two shots at him, and given the heavy traffic, he was able to save his life. Quinones also denounced that he had received threats, affirming that he was unaware of the motive. In a statement, the regional controller, Juan Pablo Camargo, regretted the events and reiterated that life for all of us is a threat here. Life for all of us is a patrimony that each and every one of the institutions must take care of. And in Haiti, it was reported that this Friday, Judge Gary Hohelian, who was in charge of the investigation into the assassination of President Jovenel Moise, resigned. The lawyer denounced a major chaos in the investigation. Hohelian was alleged personal convenience, and his resignation came days after a non-governmental organization denounced him for alleged corruption. Precisely, the dean of the court of the first instance, Bernard Saint-Ville, has rejected a request for an extension to continue the investigations presented by Judge Hohelian, who had to take over the investigation after Judge Matthew Chen Latta resigned. In this context, the United States States has taken on an increasingly important role in the investigation of the crime. In fact, the latest accusations were made by the justice system of that country. Now, on Friday, the Minister of Foreign Affairs of Cuba, Bruno Rodriguez, called on those nationals residing in other countries to participate and present their proposals and opinions in the popular debate of the draft code of families, which aims to adapt the current legal framework of the Caribbean island. The head of Cuban diplomacy stated that the opportunity will be propitious for those living abroad to contribute to improve the legislation. The foreign minister added that the contributions of the Cubans living abroad could strengthen the work of social justice with their suggestions. According to Ernesto Soberon, General Director of Consular Affairs and Cubans Living Abroad, his colleagues could be part of the discussion and debate in more than 140 countries. Between February and April of this year, Cuba will submit to popular debate the draft of the new Code of Families with the aim of adapting the current legal framework to the social realities of each group in the island. We'll be right back after this very short break. Don't go anywhere. Hi, welcome back to From the South. In Ecuador, at least four people died during a shooting in Guasmo Sur in Guayaquil. This Friday night, there was a shooting in the Playita del Guasmo sector in the south of Guayaquil, which caused four deaths and 11 injuries. Videos on social media show several people lying on the sidewalks and in one of the sports fields in the area. Armed forces carry out a joint pursuit and capture operation by land and speedboats in the Playita del Guasmo sector. Meanwhile, police protection was sent to the hospital where the injured were transferred to. Until now, in Guayaquil, at least 50 murders have been recorded in the first days of 2022. The immigration crisis in North America has shown one of its harshest faces. According to the Bureau of Customs and Border Protection, more and more children are crossing the southern border of the United States and are being detained by the U.S. Border Patrol. In the first three weeks of 2022, the number of migrant children apprehended for crossing the border increased compared to the figures for the last month of 2021. 336 children are reported to have been apprehended by federal agents after entering U.S. territory, more than double the number of the same period last year, when there were 150. Besides, 485 minors were apprehended on January 19th, implying three times more than those apprehended on December 30th. Currently, 8,254 minors are in the custody of the Department of Health and Human Services, and another 642 in the custody of Customs on Border Protection. On Saturday, a new consignment of military aid coming from the United States consisting of 90 tons of weapons and ammunition arrived at Kiev's Borispil airport. According to the U.S. Embassy in Ukraine, this is the first of several parties to a new 200 million aid package approved by President Biden in December. The donation includes close to 200,000 pounds of lethal security assistance, including ammunition for the country's armed forces. With this new authorization, the U.S. has committed more than $600 million of security assistance to Ukraine in the past year, and more than $2.7 billion in total since 2014.
Drive-in polling stations were set up in the car parking lot of Via della Missione on Rome on Saturday to allow Italian MPs to safely cast their vote for the next Italian president after several lawmakers tested positive for COVID-19. The more than 1,000 voters, senators, deputies, and regional representatives will have to find a man or woman capable of welding together different political colors as none of the political parties alone has a majority to elect the new president. According to the Italian Constitution, the head of state is elected with a secret vote, and the first three ballots will require two-thirds majority. From the fourth ballot onwards, a simple majority of 505 votes will be enough. The first ballot will start on Monday at the Chamber of Deputies in Rome. Beijing reacted on Saturday to the U.S. decision to suspend 44 flights of four domestic airlines scheduled to begin on January 30th. The decision is Washington's response to the Chinese government's announcement to suspend three U.S. airline flights because they recently carried COVID-19 passengers. For the United States, Beijing's decisions violate treaties on airline access between countries, but the Chinese government reiterates its position to demand protection of the rights of dozens of Chinese citizens who were stranded after the decision to return to the point of departure. This is not the first disagreement between the two countries in the context of the pandemic, and Beijing has again urged Washington to stop interfering and restricting the normal flow of their trade routes, though it's diplomatic representations. The Asian giant has demanded to protect the health and rights of dozens of Chinese nationals. Hundreds of Malaysians rallied in the capital on Saturday demanding the country's powerful anti-corruption chief resigned over a stock trading controversy where he owned millions of shares. Wearing masks and shouting reject corruption, the crowd of about 200 called for immediate action against Azam Baki, the Malaysian Anti-Corruption Commission's top official. Azam, a key investigator into the former regime's looting of the Malaysia development, Berhad State Fund, has been under scrutiny for weeks over allegations of improper proxy trading after he admitted to letting his brother use his account. Azam Baki has denied any wrongdoing, while Malaysia's securities regulator said this week that he had control of his account at the time of the trades, clearing him of suspicions. I think the government is taking people for fools, so I think we need to speak out democracy more than just voting one every five years. In the interim, if you do silly things, you rob the country blind, or even if you commit crimes, we should just ignore it. That shouldn't be the case. I think the government is taking people for fools. Right? So I think uh, we need to speak up. Democracy is more than just voting once every five years. In the interim, if you do silly things, you rob the country blind, or even if you commit crimes, you should just ignore it. That shouldn't be the case. Now, in Europe, health agencies confirmed the presence of the Omicron variant of the coronavirus in the 27 countries of their bloc. A report from the European Center for Disease Control and Prevention indicates that 70 percent of the cases registered in Europe are related to Omicron variant. The document details that in the last week, the increase of new cases reached 20 percent. The European Authority warned that at least 90 percent of the new infections diagnosed corresponded to the Omicron variant and stressed that vaccination against the virus attenuates the symptoms and contributes to the less severe effects of the disease. In France, the Yellow Jackets have taken to the streets and cities across France to reject against a mandatory COVID-19 vaccine pass. The document will be required as from January 24th in catering establishments, cultural institutions and long-distance trains. Authorities expect between 9,000 and 14,000 demonstrators in Paris alone and between 85,000 and 120,000 nationwide. According to organizers, protesters are also rejecting pension reforms, unemployment and social and fiscal injustice, among other policies. Hundreds gathered in Stockholm to protest against COVID-19 vaccination passes after the government recently expanded its use. Sweden has been registering record case numbers fueled by the Omicron variant. Since the beginning of the coronavirus pandemic, the country has confirmed more than 1 million cases and 15,000 deaths. We have more stories coming up after this final short break. Stay with us.
Welcome back to From the South. The United Nations Secretary General Antonio Guterres has condemned the attacks launched by the coalition led by Saudi Arabia against a detention center in the Yemeni city of Sara'a, which so far has left 60 dead and more than 100 injured. The high official also condemned other aerial bombardments in different areas of Yemen, which have left more dead and injured among them. Guterres also noted an attack on telecommunications facilities in the port city of Hudeida, which disrupted services in part of the country. The UN Secretary General recalled that direct attacks on civilians and civilian infrastructure are prohibited by international humanitarian law, and according to a statement issued by his office, urged a prompt, effective, and transparent investigation. <laughs> Leopold. Security forces fired tear gas at protesters barricading the streets and throwing rocks in Burkina Faso's capital on Saturday as anger grew at the government's inability to stop jihadist attacks spreading across the country. Several hundred people marched through downtown Ugadugu chanting for President Rahmar Christian Kabore to resign. Some people were also protesting in solidarity with neighboring Mali, whose citizens are angry at the West African Economic Regional Bloc, ECOWAS, which imposed sanctions on their country after the ruling junta delayed this year's elections. Burkina Faso's protests came amid an escalation in jihadist attacks linked to the Al-Qaeda and the Islamic State that has killed thousands and displayed 1.5 million people. In Nigeria on Thursday, jihadists kidnapped 20 children in a town from Borno State where Islamist militants wage a more than decade-long insurgency. According to a communal leader and residents from Piemi village, the ISIS WAP troops dressed in military uniforms started shooting and looting shops. Witnesses said the attackers shot dead two people and took away 13 girls and seven boys aged between 12 and 15. This came as Nigeria struggles with a string of abduction for ransom attacks on schools by criminal gangs. UNICEF reported that 1,500 school children were seized last year in 20 mass kidnappings due to the jihadist conflict in the northeast of the country. Violent U.S. attacks against Syria continue unabated. This Friday, its fighters have completely destroyed the headquarters of the Polytechnic Institute of Azake. The chaos generated by the confrontations between the separatist militias known as the Syrian Democratic Forces, supported by their Washington allies and the Daesh terrorists, have caused thousands of civilians to flee the neighborhood of Geron due to the serious clashes. In this context of violence, it also became known that the FDS and its Washington allies planned to blow up the economics faculty building under the pretext of pursuing the escapees from the mentioned prison. A 6.6 .6 earthquake left nine people injured in Japan after hitting Miyazaki Prefecture and the city of Oida on Saturday. Tsunami warnings have not yet been activated, even though the intensity of the quake was recorded at a level 5. The earthquake occurred at a depth of about 40 kilometers south the coast of the aforementioned prefectures on the southern Japanese island of Kyushu at 108 local time. The quake was also felt in other areas of Kyushu and the southwest of Honshu Island, the main island of the archipelago. At least nine people were injured, most of them with minor injuries, as well as power and water supply interruptions, but irregularities in the nuclear plants located in Kyushu were ruled out. The earthquakes are caused by the so-called Ring of Fire, one of the most active areas where the Asian country is located. Tongans said they were determined to rebuild their battered homeland in the wake of last week's devastating eruption and tsunami as a massive cleanup continued on Saturday in the Pacific Kingdom. According to the United Nations, the powerful eruption of the Unga Tonga Unga Apai volcano last Saturday triggered a tsunami that crashed across the island, affecting more than 80 percent of the population. Most locals are determined to stay there as the huge recovery efforts begin. Toxic ash polluted drinking water supplies, crops were destroyed, and at least two villages have been completely wiped out. An estimated one cubic kilometer of material blasted from the volcano, and experts uh, say the volcano will remain active for weeks to months. Protesters staged a demonstration in front of the Spanish energy giant Repsol's office in Lima after the Peruvian coast was polluted following an oil spill. Almost a million liters of crude spilled into the sea on Saturday when a tanker was hit by waves while offloading at La Pampilla refinery in Ventanilla, 30 kilometers north of Lima. 
Refinery officials originally described this spill as limited and said it was working with authorities to clean up the beaches. The refinery could face a fine of up to $34.5 million, the Environment Ministry said on Monday, as prosecutors opened an investigation into the company for environmental contamination. On Tuesday, the Energy and Mining Regulation Body, Osinagmin, ordered the suspension of operations at the refinery pending an investigation into the causes of the spill. We've come to the end of this news brief, but remember you can find these and many other stories on our website, Tell Us for English. You can also follow us on social media for all the latest news. We're on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and Telegram. For Tell Us for English, I'm Dio Martin. Thanks for watching.